All right, welcome back all you beautiful Bulletproof handymen and women to the Bulletproof Handyman Business Channel. Today we're going over the hardest learned lessons that I've had. And guys, these really are hard lessons to learn. I'm going to back each of these up with a story to provide you with an example from my own experience. But these truly are hard lessons to learn. And my hope is that if you don't learn them through my mistakes, then at the very least, if you have to learn them the hard way like I did, and there's nothing wrong with that. We all have to learn a lot of things the hard way. But if you still have to learn them the hard way, maybe you'll learn them just a little bit more quickly because you also have my stories to back you up on this. And the first, and I think the hardest one, is that your clients are not your friends. Now, I don't mean that you can't behave towards them in a friendly fashion and that it wouldn't be nice if they behaved towards you in a friendly fashion, just like the checkout girl at the supermarket is not my friend and it's not her job to be my friend. She doesn't need to do me any favors. She needs to check out my groceries. That's the, the agreement that we have with her being a provider and me being a consumer. <coughs> so your clients aren't your friends. And here's, I think, a good story that I have was there was this really rich guy over three years ago. This guy, uh, when I say really rich, he was, let's call him wealthy. He wasn't like rich, rich, but he was doing just fine for himself. And as I was doing this fascia job for him, he would stop me infrequently and ask me if I could just look at something real quick. And it would be like a broken outlet cover or something like that. But he had all these little nickel and dime things he kept wanting to add on. And because I had given him, in my opinion at the time, what I thought was a really high estimate that he approved, and I felt like I was making good money, even though I know now in hindsight I wasn't, but because I was already charging him good money, my thinking process was, yeah, let's make sure we keep this guy happy. Let's do whatever it is that he wants because he's willing to pay good money. So right at the very end, and I mean the very end after two full days of work, uh, as I was just wrapping up and packing up my tools and stuff, he pointed out a little rotten spot that was down at the bottom corner of an exterior door leading out of a garage. Not the big garage door, just a regular entry and exit door that led from his garage into the backyard. Right at the very bottom, there was a little rotten spot, just about that big. It wasn't super big. And he pointed it out and he said, Hey, do you think you could do something about that for me before you go? And I was like, yeah, I could do something about that. I actually had some exterior hardwood filler epoxy-based stuff that I had used on part of his fascia. I still had that, and it wasn't going to take long. And I said, uh, you know, I, I should probably charge you extra for this, but I appreciate your business, so I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to fix it real quick, and then I'm going to go, but it's not going to be, like, the perfect fix, but I'll, I'll take care of it. So... I went to the truck, I got the epoxy filler, I put it in there, kept loading up my stuff. When I was ready to go, I went to him and I said, hey, just so you know, I put that epoxy on the door, you'll just need to sand it off and paint a little bit. And he's like, oh, well, you're not going to paint it? Like, why, why would you fix it and not paint it? And at this point in time, he had been so friendly to me the entire time that I literally felt like peer pressured by him. The way he was looking at me and talking to me, I thought, oh God, no, I'm going to ruin all of this hard work. He's not going to like me just because I don't want to paint this. So I said, well, I mean, I'd have to charge you if I have to go get new paint and stuff. And he said, no, 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 I already have some paint that'll match. And I said, okay, well, if the paint matches, then I'll go ahead and paint it. So he gave me the paint. He went back inside. I painted the spot, feathered it a little bit so it blended kind of. And then went and knocked on his door and said, okay, I got it painted, I'm about to head out. And he came out and he looked at it and he was like, well, it doesn't really match now because the door's all sun faded. Could you paint the rest of the door? And again, and this is a weakness. Like if y'all want to comment and say, oh, you shouldn't be so weak, you shouldn't care what people think about you, absolutely correct. I wasn't strong in that moment. I needed my business to succeed so badly that I was scared that if I didn't make him like me, then he may not, and he did one of my red flags actually that I've told you all about, which is he kept talking on and on and on about how happy he was with my work and how he can't wait to recommend me out to all of his friends. And again, my brain just goes, God, if I make this guy mad, if, if, if I don't keep him liking me, then he's not going to recommend me. 
So I painted the whole door. And then he came out, and he's like, oh, well, now the door doesn't match the trim. And guess what I did? I'm not proud to admit it. I'm admitting it because I think y'all need to hear it. I'm not proud to admit it, but I let him pressure me into painting all the trim on his door. So I fixed a door and painted the whole door and all of the trim around the door. I put like an extra hour and a half into this job for free. And there was no reason for it other than because I needed him to like me because I thought if he liked me, that would help my business succeed. So instead of behaving the way that any normal business would behave with this guy, I behaved the way a person would behave with another person who wants that person to like them. So long story short is your clients don't need to like you as a person. They're not your friends. They don't need to be your friends. It's good if they can like you. Don't get me wrong, it's good. If they like you, that's better than if they don't like you. You don't want to give them reasons not to like you. But if the reason they don't like you is because you won't do them favors, they're not liking you to begin with. They're, they're liking the favors. So your clients don't need to be your friends. They're clients. The, the way that a business should interact with its customers is not the same way that a friend should interact with a friend. Those are different categories. They have different names. There's a reason that the word client and the word friend are not interchangeable words. Moving on to the next one. This is also a very hard one, guys, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably over-talk this one, too, because I don't want to sound like an asshole, but a business is not a charity, and I'm going to give you a really great example um, of what I mean, and then I'll give you the example of when I was behaving like a charity, but just look at it this way before you get all upset and think that I'm saying don't ever help people out. When I say a business is not a charity... A business is your source of revenue. It's your source of income. It's how you provide for your family. So if, if you have a nine to five, right? You work at Home Depot stock and shelves. Absolutely, as a good human being and as a good citizen to the world, if and when you can help somebody, you should help people. We should all help each other all the time in any way, shape, or form that we can. But if somebody's help requires that you miss a day of work to help them, if, if somebody just comes to you and says, hey, that old lady down the street needs a new toilet installed and she has the toilet, but she doesn't have anyone to install it. Can you take the day off of work today and install this toilet? Well, if you've got a family to provide for, the answer should be, if you can, yes, I can install that toilet this weekend or I can install that toilet today after work or tomorrow after work. Giving of your time freely to help your fellow citizens, there's nothing wrong with that. But you have a responsibility to make money to provide for yourself and your family. That's a responsibility that every grown adult in the United States have. We all have to go make money so that we can pay our bills, and that's our first responsibility. We can't forego that just to go help people, because if we don't take care of ourselves, we're not going to find ourselves in a position where we can help other people. So I hope that clarifies a little bit when I say a business is not a charity. I'm not saying you as a person or even your business as a business can't ever do nice things for people, but you are not a charity because what you're going to find when you start out in this business, or if you've already been in it, it's already happened to you probably dozens upon dozens of times, is people are going to come to you and tell you about some sad story and how somebody needs you to work for them cheaper than you normally would or it'll be the people who call you who see your ad call your phone and say i need this and you say here's the cost and then they explain to you whatever's going on in their life which is very sad and very real and very legitimate but the point is whatever's going on just like people with jobs have to show up monday through friday eight to five if they want to keep that job and continue to be able to pay their bills and take care of their family and you can't forego your responsibilities just to go help everybody that needs to be helped, your business is in the same boat. So uh, I'll, I'll give you one example of what I did. This was one of the times I tried to be a handyman years and years ago when I didn't succeed because I did not know what I was doing. I really, I didn't know the numbers. I didn't know the math. I didn't understand how a business properly functions to become successful and to become profitable so that you can use your time to help people in the future. I didn't understand that, 
And there was this old couple that somebody approached me, a friend who knew I was a handyman, approached me and said, hey, I've got this old couple that bought a shed, like a big, the big plastic ones, but I mean a really big plastic shed. And they need somebody to assemble it, and they need it put up on a base off the ground, but they don't have much money. Do you think you could help them out? So I ended up spending three days building this huge base for this gigantic plastic shed. I spent three days building the base and assembling the shed and then moving everything to the other side of the yard because it wasn't on the side of the yard. Last minute, they decided it wasn't where it needed to be. And I did all of that for $25 an hour. And, of course, today, running a successful handyman business again, I'm embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed that I helped somebody. I'm embarrassed that I was pressured, that I allowed myself to be pressured into not taking care of my responsibility of earning income as an American adult who has bills to pay. I, I just didn't take care of my responsibility doing that for myself and my family, and instead I gave this old couple all of my time, which is all of my money. I didn't make really any money because if you know what the overhead is in this business, $25 an hour really doesn't cover your overhead. That's You just worked for free, basically. So again, um, a business is not a charity. And again, yes, you should help people as a good citizen often, always, anytime you can, but not at the expense of you providing income and security for yourself and your family. It's super hard to not do, guys. You're just... You're going to want people to like you, and you're going to want to say yes, and you just can't. First, you have to take care of yourself, and when you have yourself in a solid position, then you're in a position to truly help other people. In fact, I'm going to give you all a quick example of the last time I did. It was, at this point, it may be three months ago. This is the last time I did, like, a big favor for somebody. A friend of mine had another friend who's... I don't know, niece or grand niece had some sort of issues with medications and whatnot, and she drove her car in the middle of the night, some sort of sleepwalking type of thing, and crashed her car into the shed of the lady's house that she was staying at. And this lady, everybody knew, was going to be pissed. She was out of town, luckily, for like two weeks, but she was going to be pissed, and she was already on the verge of kicking this woman out. So in order to help keep her from getting in trouble and getting kicked out, I rebuilt the entire front wall of this shed, the entire thing, all new, uh, all new siding, all new trim, reused the window, matched the paint, matched everything so that it wasn't noticeable that it had been crashed into and then repaired. So I did this, and the price I did it for, I didn't give a price. I said, okay, look, this is going to take me a full day. Normally, I would charge $600, like to a friend, for a full day. I like to make a little more than that. If I had bid this job, I probably would have bid it, honestly, at like 1800 just because of all the unknowns that I could have run into. But I said, look, my, my full day rate, like minimum, is typically 600 I know she can't pay me 600 but that's what my rate is. So I'm going to do the job. She'll purchase the materials. She can decide what to pay me after I'm done. And I think she paid me like 250 So I kind of made basically nothing for that day. But I did it to be a good citizen. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to brag or anything. I'm just trying to say, yes, I help people. And yes, you should help people. But your business is not a charity. you got to take care of business before you start doing charity work. Next, uh, trust is for people, not businesses. Your business doesn't need to trust anybody. Everything should be written down. Everything should be agreed upon in writing. Because if you trust as a business, if you do that, maybe nine times out of ten, that trust will be well placed. But there's going to come a time, there's going to come a day, where somebody asks you to do some amount of work without a deposit or without an agreement in writing, <coughs> without... Any number of things. They're going to be asking you to trust them that if you'll just do this for them, they'll make sure you're taken care of. Now, for me, this was a, a big one, kind of a big one. It was a big one in terms of how long it actually took me to get paid. 
Again, this was a very expensive house way up in the foothills, like multi-multi-million dollar gorgeous house. And the old tenants had moved out, and the new homeowners were going to owner-occupy. So they were going to stop renting it out for a while, and they were going to live there. And the previous tenants had painted about half the walls in the house, maybe a third of the walls in the house. They had pl painted this dark, 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 dark navy blue really dark blue and they had covered this gigantic like 14 foot tall by 14 foot long wall with tile it's a peel and stick adhesive tile that this entire wall was covered in and they needed me to paint over the blue which if you've ever painted over something dark 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 blue that may as well be a black you're gonna need one coat of primer, if not two, and one coat of paint, if not two. But you're going to need three coats of something, and then you're still going to be going back doing a little bit of touch-up wherever a tiny bit of blue is, is flecking through here and there. So what happened with this was I sent an estimate, right? And then I got a phone call on the weekend from the property manager, and the property manager said, hey, the homeowners want to move in in like three days, so can you get this done? And I said, yeah, man, I, I sent an estimate. Just get the estimate approved. And he's like, I can't get the estimate approved right now. I can't reach the right people. But I promise you, we'll take care of you if you can just get it done. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I guess I'll do that. But, and by the way, guys, this was only, you know, I, I, I take a while to learn my lessons. This was only, I'm going to say, a year and a half to two years ago at the most. It was probably about a year and a half ago. And this company had never asked me to just do them a favor and do a large job out of my pocket without any written approval that somebody had the money available to pay me. So I did it. In fact, I subcontracted the tile wall. I scraped off most of the tile. There was one little spot that I left at the end and just paid the other guy to do but I actually subcontracted a super expensive drywall guy to have him clean off the rest of the stuff on that wall, and it needed to be skim-coated end-to-end, top-to-bottom, and then it needed to be uh, textured to match the rest of the house, and then it needed to be, of course, painted to match the rest of the house. So I was very deep into this job, very, very deep into this job. A bunch of time goes by and I didn't get paid and a bunch of more time goes by and I still didn't get paid and I sent out emails and I was told that we're waiting on the tenant to pay us the tenant who did the painting and the tiling that shouldn't have been done they said we're waiting on the tenant to pay us so that we can pay you and I wasn't happy and I shot an email back and I was like okay this is what it is but I need to get paid and in the future just so we're all on the same page. In the future, I don't do work for tenants. I only do work for property managers and or the homeowner, but I only do work for the people who request the work, and I expect that the people who request the work have the money to pay me and intend on paying me. And they were like, I'm really sorry. You know, we're trying, we're trying, we're trying. So I was upset. But this company also sends me let's call it a hundred thousand dollars a year worth of work maybe it's eighty thousand maybe it's a hundred and twenty maybe it's seventy five i don't know but i mean this company is about half of my business's revenue so i wasn't about to throw a big fit and potentially lose my biggest client just because of this one job that was done by a brand new property manager but in the end the deal was what the deal was they couldn't pay me i was upset I reminded them every few weeks, and we go forward, fast forward three months in. Three months in, I was very angry, and I was about to drop them as a client, and right before I was about to drop them as a client, I got the exact same kind of request from a different property manager. Almost the, not the same kind of job, but it was there had been a leak upstairs, right? So it's like a condo type thing. The property management company is managing the downstairs unit. The upstairs unit, who's owned by somebody else who lives there, they had a leak in their bathroom or their kitchen or whatever. Actually, it probably would have been the kitchen. It's probably the same layout, and it was in the kitchen down here. So probably the kitchen upstairs ruined a whole bunch of the ceiling here, and they needed me to fix the ceiling. 
And it was the same thing. I said, yeah, I sent y'all an estimate on that already. It just hasn't been approved, but I'm happy to schedule it as soon as it gets approved. And they said the same thing. They're like, ah, we can't get a hold of the owner, but, you know, we've talked to him before, and he's aware of about how much the estimate was. He didn't have a problem. If you can just, we need this done now because the tenants that have already moved in, they're really upset that this wasn't fixed before they move in, and they're going to go get a lawyer and blah, like, the tenants were raising a big stink, so they really needed this done. And this was the beautiful part, was I was able to say, at this point, you know, I had learned my lesson, finally. And at this point, I finally said, okay, I tell you what, y'all still owe me money from that other big job that I did. That other big one I did, that I've been asking y'all to pay me for for three months now, I still haven't been paid for. And that was the first and only time that I've ever done a favor for y'all and done a large job without a deposit and without any approval for the job to be done with a guarantee that the payment's going to be there when it's done. So I'm not going to start this job until you get me the payment. I'm not going to schedule this job either because then I have to block off a day where there could have been other work. I will call this tenant and I will schedule it instantly. I will be straight over there as if it was an emergency the moment I receive payment for that other job. But from now on, I won't be doing any jobs for y'all that are not on an estimate that's been signed and approved. Well, guess what? They were able to pay me the same day. So the money that they hadn't paid me for three months that they had been incapable of coming up with for me for three months when I wasn't willing to do that next big job on a favor basis for them, they were able to pay me in one day. So that's my policy now, and it should have always been my policy. And in fact, had you asked me before that ever happened, I'd have probably said that was my policy. I probably didn't even know that when confronted with that situation, that I would fold and I would go ahead and do a job without any written approval for the job. So that's my big example on that one. And that's just the basic point is trust is for people, not for businesses. Your business doesn't need to trust. In fact, I wrote down a little quote here too, because here's how I want you to think of it. If you're having a hard time saying no to something in a situation like this, I want you to think to yourself that what they're asking you to do essentially is they're saying, please put your family's financial security at risk for me. That's what they're saying. When they say, please do this job without guarantee of payment, without anything written, approved, saying we're aware of the price and we're willing to pay it upon completion. When they ask you to do that kind of favor, what they're asking you to do is to put your family at risk, your family's financial security. They're asking you to put them at risk for them. So a property manager saying, do you mind risking your family for me? No, I, I won't be risking my family and their financial security for you. My business won't be doing that anyways. Maybe I would as a person, who knows, for you as a person, but I'm not a person and you're not a person. I'm a business and you're a business. And no, I will not put my family's financial security at risk for you. Next is uh, diversify your clients. Guys, it is so easy in this business to like find a nice little niche where you've got one client that can just keep you. You could be making 150 grand a year, year after year, with never-ending work that just never stops rolling in at a good premium. If you only have that one client, as nice as that sounds, if you only have that one client, you are one client away from losing your entire business. So... When I first got into property management, not my first property manager, but at the very beginning of when I sort of found this route that I decided to take, my biggest leap into it was with one of Tucson's biggest, not just property management companies, they're big in property management, but one of the biggest realtor companies here in Tucson. You see their signs everywhere. And somehow or another, I got on with them as a handyman. Well, I mean, not somehow or another. It's because I sought them out and I pitched myself to them and sold my services and then kicked ass. And I quickly became their main handyman, like their number one guy. Essentially, almost everything was sent to me and whatever was sent to somebody else was just the overflow work or one of the very few categories of work that I'm not skilled at doing. And guys, I was busy 
all day, every day, seven days a week. I was knocking out minimum five jobs a day, seven days a week. I only took days off to schedule, and those days were insane. I had no time for anything, but I was making money hand over fist. They weren't complaining about my prices. The work never stopped coming in. At one point, I was booked out something like six weeks with like little one-offs, like five jobs a day, seven days a week for like six weeks. Just a never-ending flood of work that paid really great. And then, in fact, this relates to actually one of my, I think my biggest like semi-viral short <laughs> that I get lots of hate mail on. The story is that this company, so two things happened within a short little two-week period. One is they asked me to bring my LLC in underneath their umbrella corporation. So something like their corporation sort of buying, owning my LLC, but with me still as president or whatever you want to call it. Me still in charge, doing the same thing I'm doing, but they just wanted to put me beneath their LLC, <coughs> and they didn't specifically say this, but what they were getting around to, what they were trying to do, is a very common thing you'll find, which is, if my LLC, that has its own little business name, that's not the same as the name of this big realtor slash property management company, my name's different from their name, but if I'm beneath their LLC, then we're all one company, right? And they would, throughout the negotiation and contracting process, because they would be purchasing essentially my company and providing inventory and vehicles and all kinds of other stuff, had we gone that route, the idea was actually going to be what I know now in hindsight that I've learned about is what they wanted to do was make me an exclusive vendor so I get all their work. I would be responsible for both doing a bunch of the work and hiring out a bunch of the work to other handymen and subcontracting things out and finding other contractors to do bigger jobs. They wanted me to run all of the maintenance only for the rental side of their business. And then they would be able to take a giant cut of my profits, which is actually illegal for them to not disclose that to the owners of the rental properties. But anyways, they asked me to do that, right? That was at about the time when I had finally figured out, because I was making the money daily with them, and I had bumped my price. This was when I was really starting to figure a lot out. Um, I basically replied to that email and said, so it was from a secretary, not from the owner, but the secretary emailed me to say, hey, the owner wanted me to talk to you about the possibility of doing this. I think it's really exciting. So I emailed her back and I said, look, I'll think about it. I'm always open to anything so we can have a conversation. But just so you know, it's very clear to me where I can take this business financially. So if I were to agree to do it, it would not be for 80000 a year or 100000 a year or 125000 a year. I don't know what the number would be, but y'all would need to pay me not only as much as I'm figuring out I'm going to be able to make over the course of this next year, but more than that because I'm going to be salaried now and I'm going to be taking on even more expenses uh, or more responsibilities. Now I'll be the guy that has to wake up at 2 a.m. every time there's an emergency. Like, I'll have no choice. Y'all will, I'll essentially be putting myself back in the position of being an employee if I say yes. So I'm willing to consider it and to talk about it, but I'm not going to be cheap about it. And they didn't say anything back. And I saw my workload drop. It didn't go away, but I saw my workload drop. So I could tell they weren't happy. Now, I had other clients I was working on at the time as well, so that was okay. But after that, this was within like a week, week and a half, they had another company. They were buying a property management company. And the, the sale of that company had to close like, I don't on a Tuesday or whatever it was. And for that sale to close... All the books and all the documentation and all the homes all had to, everything was negotiated for that sale with everything being in a particular condition. One of the conditions was that all of the maintenance was up to date. So this guy had a move out happen right before the owner of the company they were buying had a move out happen 
right before an unexpected he didn't know that the people were going to be moving out until it was too late and he had to get the home in its proper condition and reconcile the tenant's deposit and close all of that out before the sale could close on a Tuesday. And if y'all know anything about buying homes or buying businesses, it's very expensive when you schedule a closing date and then that closing date doesn't happen. To redo it, all the paperwork has to be redone. <coughs> so they asked me to do this move out for this guy as a favor. So I agreed. The guy sent me, uh, you know, the address and the list of stuff he wanted fixed. And I can't even remember... I, I'm pretty sure I did go to the property. I can write estimates without going to the property, depending on what the work is, if I have photos. I can't remember if I had photos or if I went in person. The long story short is I wrote him an estimate because I'm not familiar with him. Now, this company that I was with, I would just do the work and invoice him and they would pay me. I didn't need to write estimates for moveouts. But with this guy, I'm like, well, I better send him an estimate just to make sure. So I sent him the estimate. And then I'm at my in-law's house one day, just like a beautiful spring, you know, afternoon, nice, great day. And this guy calls me and he says, hey, I wanted to talk about the estimate. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And keep in mind, I'm doing him a favor. I don't need the work. This company was already keeping me so full of work. I had no time for anything else at all. I didn't need the work. And he wasn't going to be owning a company anymore come Tuesday. He was So he wasn't even a potential future client for me to want to make happy. This was purely a favor that I was doing. And he goes over my estimate and he's going line by line and he's saying, okay, so he's like, you know, I used to be a contractor, so I know the materials for this should cost about this much. And I'm like, yeah, it's pretty close, you know, not spot on, but pretty close. And he's like, and the labor should take about, you know, 30 minutes for a set of blinds or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, pretty close. And he goes all the way down the list. And I don't itemize. So my list doesn't say price per each. My list just has a fine. It's just got a list of the jobs he gave me with one big price at the bottom. And he finally says, okay, so it seems to me like this should only take about six hours. And... It seems to me if the materials cost this much, then you're trying to make about $100 an hour. And I said, yeah, it's about accurate. I mean, it's maybe not exactly, but yeah, I, I try to make about $100 an hour. I try not to even leave the house unless it's going to be to make $100 an hour for six hours. Not that I won't, but I mean, that's how I was. I was making approximately $600 a day working on the job about six hours a day. So that was in line with my billing. And I said, yeah, you know, that's about what I'm trying to do. I usually don't leave the house unless it's to make $600 for that day. And he said, well, I got guys, you know, who will do this for 35 an hour. And I was like, well, I'm absolutely fine with you hiring them. I was told you didn't have anybody and that that's why I needed to do this job. But, you know, I, I'm super busy, so I'm definitely not going to be offended if you want to let one of your guys do it. And he just hung up the phone. And then the next day, I didn't get any new jobs from that big company that was buying his company, which was weird because I got new jobs literally every day, a handful a day, every single day. I got no new jobs. I was still completing jobs and getting them signed off and getting them invoiced. And then the next day, I didn't get any jobs. And I texted and was like, hey, uh, I noticed I haven't had any new jobs come in for the last couple of days. Is something wrong? No reply. And I texted back again, you know, and the next day said, hey, I'm just checking in. I haven't heard anything from you guys. No reply. And I finally figured out after about four days, I was ghosted. Like, I, I don't know if it was because I wouldn't bring my LLC in under their umbrella corporation without getting reimbursed properly, or if it was because of this other property management company, the owner of whom, you know, probably was pissed at me and went and talked shit about me to them, or if it was both of them put together. Uh, but they just ghosted me. That, that moment, I was ghosted. Never, well, I can't say never. About three months later, they did try to come back. They sent me a request for an estimate, and I gave them a stupid high estimate that I had no intention of doing based on the price because I was done. I had moved on and found other clients. But that's the real point of this is because I only had the one client, that was very scary. Had I not found new clients right away, I'd have been back at my old job miserable. So 
what I did was I went and I found quite a few more property managers. And I mean, like, I hit the pavement, guys. I made sure I got my name out everywhere. I talked to everybody. And lo and behold, my two clients that I have today, my two biggest clients that I have today, multiple property managers within each company. But when I say client, I mean the company itself and each company having multiple managers. <coughs> Those two comprise probably 85% of my work. The number varies throughout the year, but basically those two are most of my business. And then I have a handful of smaller property management clients that comprise the other 10 to 15%. And I'm in a position now where if I lose one manager, it literally won't even matter. In fact, I don't need to be doing as much work as what I've done for the last three years now that I'm getting better and better and better at this more efficient better with materials, better with my time, better with my scheduling, etc., etc. I don't need to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, just never ending. I don't have to do that. So if I lost one property manager, I probably wouldn't even try to replace them. I would just find other things to do with that time. Uh, and if I lost an entire company, both of them being almost equal in size, one of them slightly bigger than the other, but if I lost an entire property management company, all I would need to do, the other company, the work I already have for either company at any point in time, I already have a couple weeks, maybe even three to four, depending on how busy we are. I already have enough work for them to keep me busy for some extended period of time with new jobs from them that will continue coming in over that period of time. So all I would really need to do is just take some extra time each day to stop in to a few different property management places until I found a new client or two or three new clients to replace the older, larger client. But you need to be diversified because if you're not diversified, they have a stranglehold on you. I don't know what I would have done. Again, to tell you the truth, I don't know what I would have done if instead of ghosting me, if they would have called me and said, you're going to drop your prices down or we're going to take all of your work away this instant. If they had said that, if they had done that, I like to think that I would have just manned up and been like, ha, 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 you can't tell me what to do. But honestly, like, I didn't think it was possible for me to go replace that company so quickly. I found out it was possible because I had to. But that would have scared the heck out of me. So diversify your clients. I don't care how good your client is. If you have one client who just always, like say a real estate investor who always has five or six homes and he just wants to keep you busy remodeling those homes day in and day out for some sort of hourly rate, even if it's a high hourly rate or even if it's estimates and stuff. <coughs> All you need is for that one investor that's been keeping you busy for six months to decide he doesn't want your services anymore, for his cousin to move down from Tennessee and his cousin to say, aha, I'll do all that for half the price. You don't need to pay him that. And then boom, guys, you're done. Because you thought he was your friend, but he wasn't your friend. He was a client and you treated him like a friend and you trusted him, which is one of the other things I just went over. Don't trust, they're not your friends, they're your clients. Your job is to give them a stellar product at a fair price and to maintain a reputation. But don't get friendly enough to think that it's okay to rest your entire business and, again, to rest your family's financial security on you trusting one other business or one other person to keep you in business. So diversify your clients. Have enough that if you lose any one particular client, it doesn't hit you. That's the point of bulletproof because that's, you know, when you got a bulletproof vest, you could be killed if you're shot with a cannon or with a 50 caliber that can pierce your vest. But the point of bulletproof is you can take some hits to the chest with some rounds. And as long as it ain't too many of them and it doesn't break through that vest, you built a business that can take those hits of losing clients and still move on and keep fighting and find new clients and still succeed in the end. Next, uh, yeah, this is a really good one. Before you start, <coughs> before you start your jobs, you're going to be taking pictures all the time, just all the time. Everybody's going to want before and after pictures or at least after pictures. What I'm going to tell you, and you have to use your judgment on this, guys. I'm not saying if you're replacing a smoke detector, you need to take a 4K video of the entire room that you're in. 
But before you start most jobs, look around, inspect around, take a few pictures that clearly show your surroundings so that you can't be blamed for anything after the fact. And that doesn't just include pictures, that includes testing. So I'm gonna give you an example, really good one. This one, this one did not result in me losing money, luckily. But it did result in me losing a lot of work that I already had approved that I was going to be doing. So this investor bought a house uh, way up again in the foothills, really rich place. He bought this new house. He was remodeling the whole thing. He was making it all. This was going to be an Airbnb, like an $800 a night Airbnb. Everything had to be perfect. Everything had to be luxury. It just, it all had to be absolutely stellar. So one of the things he wanted me to do was replace the switches and the outlets in the house. And yes, by the way, for you electricians out there, it is legal for me, a handyman, to replace switches and outlets. That does not require a permit. I've checked with the Arizona Contractor Association multiple times, including talking to investigators. The answer is always the same. If it's under $1,000 and doesn't require a permit, even if it is electrical or plumbing technically, like a faucet, everybody's always asking, is a faucet plumbing or is it just the plumbing that feeds the faucet? What about the supply lines? What about the shutoff valve? Or is it only the pipes that are in the wall? The answer in Arizona is if it's under $1,000 and it doesn't require a permit. So any electrical or plumbing that requires a permit is going to require a license. If it's over $1,000, no matter what it is, require some kind of license or another. But this guy wanted all the outlets and switches replaced with brand new ones. That was a separate bid I gave him for a separate job. He said yes. I went to the house. I replaced everything wire for wire, just one wire for another. Now, I would never try to wire a house, obviously, but I am extremely familiar with wiring. I've been an avionics tech on aircraft, which, which means wiring. It's all the electronics on the entire aircraft. That's what I've done most of my life. I've put in all brand new radar systems, nose to tail, communications, navigations, power distribution, all of it. I know wiring. Simple things like three-way switches are not a big deal. But here's what happened was I didn't test everything before I went and replaced everything. I just went in and just started replacing. And I did wire for wire on everything through the entire house. And then I tested, I, I thought I tested everything when I was done. At least I went and stuck my tester in all the outlets and I flipped switches everywhere I went. But more just to make sure all the lights came on rather than making sure every switch does something. Which was not the right thing to do. I agree. If you want to comment, oh, you should have. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, guys. I should have. So I didn't. And then a couple weeks later, I get a phone call from the property manager that was working for the investor who was going to be managing this property. And she says, hey, <coughs> she says, hey, the owner of that property you did all those switches and stuff on needs you to go back because uh, apparently one of the three-way switches doesn't work. And I was like, okay, well, uh, I'm pretty sure everything worked before, but I'll go back and check it out. And I went to the switch that they said, and basically the guy's issue was that when you flip the switch up and down, it doesn't do anything to anything. All, all of the fixtures individually can be turned on and off. You know, there's a switch for every fixture, and there's two switches for most of the fixtures. But there's this one switch that's a three-way switch, and it just doesn't seem to do anything. So I went back, and I mean, guys, this is super simple. You look at your three-way switch. It's got three wires on it, and you, you know which color goes in which hole. I didn't even use colors anyways. I did a one-for-one -one swap, which is how I tended to do things on aircraft. I find that to be less mistake-ridden because sometimes people could use the wrong color wire or whatever. But I did a one-for-one -one swap, and the wire colors also matched up. And I looked at it and looked at it. I, I rang it out to all sorts of different places around the house and nothing rang out to it. It was as if those wires did not connect to anything anywhere at all, other than the circuit breaker panel, of course, but they didn't seem to be controlling anything. So 
I just basically told her, I was like, look, this switch doesn't do anything. It probably used to do something. This place was super old. It was like, uh, is vintage a word you could use? It was like an older Spanish style Adobe sort of, yes, yeah, sp like Spanish colonial. It was an old place that had had a lot of things done to it for a hundred years. And I said, whatever this switch is, it just doesn't do anything. And she's like, well, did you test it before you started? And I was like, well, no, I didn't. I really wish I would have now, but it just doesn't do anything. Every fixture turns on, everything is working. The fact that he can't figure out what this switch is for is not my problem. Now, luckily, I had already been paid for this job, but I had also submitted other estimates for work that he was thinking of having done later on in the year. And this guy was really angry. He threatened to sue me, like literally threatened to use a lawyer and to take me to court. Luckily, I'm super familiar with lawyers because I had needed a lawyer for not, not for any criminal stuff or some civil stuff previously. And I had learned that there's no money better spent than on a lawyer. If you need a lawyer, there's no w better way to spend your money. And I was very confident that there was no way in hell this guy was going to be able to prove that I was responsible for a switch that doesn't seem to do anything. So I just said, look, I'm sorry, but I'm not refunding his money. I didn't make any mistakes. The switch doesn't go to anything. And me and the property manager were not friends, but on friendly terms. You know what I mean? Like she, she wasn't uh, just like a stone-faced business over here. She appreciated me and what I did for her by making her life easy, which she's the one I actually learned from, that if you can learn to make a property manager's life easy, you'll get all of her jobs. She'll send everything to you, because if you're the guy who doesn't make her life easy, you ain't getting nothing. But she actually called me and told me, she said, hey, I just wanted you to know, I sent an electrician out there, like a certified electrician, paid a bunch of money, like the the property management company paid for it, not the homeowner. The owner of the property management company who was in Phoenix was like, we have to get this resolved, find a good electrician. This guy is going to be spending a lot of money with us because that company worked on a percentage basis. So imagine 800 a night and your company's taking 15% of that for managing it. It's a lot of money. So they said, just send an electrician out and get it fixed. Well, guess what? A certified electrician went out there rang everything out. He had like the special equipment where you plug things into like every socket and every outlet and into the circuit breaker panel and bring up a laptop and it basically will show you the connectivity throughout the house. And guess what, guys? The damn switch wasn't hooked up to anything, nor was it designed to be. He pulled the ceiling fans down and looked at the wiring. There was no extra wiring that I missed on any ceiling fans or light fixtures. None of that. That switch was just deactivated. He found where it had been deactivated. It was capped off. Whatever it used to do, it wasn't supposed to do anymore, and I didn't mess up. But I got a lot of trouble in my life because I didn't just check everything first. Had I checked everything first, I could have just tested every switch and said, this switch doesn't seem to do anything. Document it down, email the property manager before I start and say, hey, I haven't removed anything. I just want you to know here's an outlet that doesn't work. Here's a switch that doesn't seem to do anything. Here's two other outlets that don't seem to be grounded. I just want you to know the condition of things before I start so that we're on the same page that I will return things to the same condition for the agreed upon price. Another one that was real simple, stupid, short and easy was just I'd, I worked on a GFCI out outlet in a bathroom and then there was a different outlet that after I was done didn't work, but I didn't test it before I got started. I didn't test that outlet, the other one that wasn't in the bathroom but was nearby. Since I didn't test nearby outlets, when they said, hey, the outlet doesn't work after you finished, the assumption is it's because of me. Now, I went back, pulled the outlet that didn't work. It didn't take any time, really, but I pulled the outlet that didn't work, and literally the power wire was just pulled off. It, it's a, it was a stab from the back sort of outlet, and those can sometimes just pop right out. So the wiring had just popped out of an outlet that was 12 feet away from where I'm working, had nothing to do with me, but just to maintain that good relationship, I still had to make that trip over there to fix that outlet. 
And then luckily I told them the whole deal and I was like, this wasn't my fault. There was actually a wire not connected, which means this outlet had never been working previously. Uh, and they said, okay, go ahead and send us an invoice for that. So luckily I was able to invoice it and everything was smooth. But again, I learned my lessons the hard way, guys. I'm 43 and I wasn't good at doing this until I was about 40. And I tried other times in my life. So the big lesson here is test everything, take pictures of your surroundings, make sure that the condition before you work is known and documented officially before you start doing stuff. Because if you do a bunch of stuff and then after you're done, somebody finds an issue, it's real easy for them to just blame the handyman and make the handyman fix it for free. So be careful. Finally, uh, provide disclaimers and or set expectations. And what I mean by this, I'm just going to give some super quick examples. This is one of the smallest ones. I've very rarely been screwed, or at least if I have, it's been in teeny tiny ways with this. But as an example, if you do a patch and paint on a house and you have to go get new matching paint made, you have to take a sample out of the wall and go get your new matching paint made to match that wall to do your patch and paint, the odds of your match being perfect are very low even if you have I have places in town that I know are great at matching paint and I have places that I will never go to because they're horrible at it but even the best paint matching equipment and software and the best quality materials matching paint is never going to be a true and perfect match even the same if you buy like Swiss coffee which is a super common you can buy it pre-mixed already in a five gallon bucket it's colored to Swiss coffee, which is just like an off-white that is extremely popular for rentals. A bucket of Swiss coffee bought this month is not going to match a bucket of Swiss coffee bought three months from now. It's going to be damn close. Like, you're barely going to be able to tell, but if you're looking, you can tell. So, provide disclaimers and set expectations. If you're requested to do a patch and paint, let them know, hey, by the way, there are dozens of sheens from dozens of different paint manufacturers, and there is no foolproof way to make a perfect sheen match. There are also tons of different bases that are used for these that are going to give a different look to it, a slightly different tint to it. Grays, purples, um, like mid browns any sort of like strong color that's in the mid-range for some reason but like i said also the grays is a big one grays are super hard to match the sheens are hard to match so much is hard to match and even one wall that's you know say purple from top to bottom if there were pets and children or lots of cooking in the house that put smoke into the air or smokers or incense or candles or just people who tended to rub against the walls a lot, skinny hallways. The paint from top to bottom that was all the same color the day it was painted is no longer all the same color. It's dirty down here. It's dirty up there. It may be cleaner in the middle. At different heights, there's going to be different things going on. So provide that disclaimer. If you're tasked with something like a patch and paint, provide the disclaimer of, we're going to match this paint as best we can. However, the only way to get a perfect match on a wall is to repaint the entire wall. So although we will do our absolute best and although we do believe you'll be happy with the result, the disclaimer is we're going to do this. We're going to charge the money and, and that's it. You don't get to come back and say, I don't feel like it matches enough. It's going to match as good as we can make it match for X amount of dollars, and that's the best you're going to get. Now, you do have, and again, guys, don't use the wording I just used. That's me having an attitude on a video talking to you. But provide that disclaimer. Also provide a disclaimer that your warranty is not all-encompassing. Your warranty is for any work that you've done that can be shown that the reason it failed is because of you. So let's say you go patch a roof, right? If you patch a roof or you like seal coat an entire roof and then nine months later there's a leak in that roof, yes, you have a warranty, whether it's one year or whatever, but it needs to be shown 
that you did something wrong that caused that leak. Because if they go over there with roofers, if they send a roofer out to look at a new leak on something that you seal coated nine months ago, and that roofer tears that whole roof out and just says, yeah, yeah, whoever did this before didn't do a good job, and that's why you have this expensive problem. Well, guess what? If he didn't take a picture of the area first and show whatever it was that he's saying is the problem, if he tears that all out, you can't show that you were responsible for that. So for all you know, a tree branch fell on that roof and gashed it wide open and then got blown off the roof. For all you know, an AC guy, an HVAC guy got up on that roof and gouged the flat roof open and that's how the water got, got in. For all you know, a squirrel or a raccoon, any number of things could have happened to have caused this, this issue. It needs to be shown that you are in fact responsible for the problem not just the fact that you worked on it less than a year ago doesn't automatically make you responsible so have some wording for that and uh finally in the same you know provide disclaimers and set expectations aside from all of the other jobs that you should get to know your jobs and get to know what can come back that's not necessarily your fault like what types of things are likely to go bad despite your best efforts and despite you having done things correctly the last one is i have a disclaimer it's not a disclaimer it's more of an offer but all of my estimates and invoices say that i'm available for touch-ups for free for th for three days after invoicing so when the job is complete and i send the invoice not three days after they pay me they might wait two weeks to pay me but after i conclude the job and send the invoice there's 72 hours w during which i'll go back and do touch-ups so let's say you ask me to do a whole interior paint job on a house which i don't really do but if you wanted me to do a whole interior paint job on your house and i finish that and i invoice after i invoice that job if you come back to me two weeks later with a list saying, you know, there's like four spots that you want me to go back and touch up, I, if you're a good client, I might, especially if it is my fault. Like if I look at the picture and it is me, I missed something, I'm going to go back and fix that. My warranty is indefinite if you can show me that I actually did something wrong. But you can't just come back and be unhappy with my work two, three, four, five, six weeks later because nobody ever went and looked at it and finally somebody showed up and they don't feel like it's what they thought it was going to be. I don't know what happened between then and now. You had three days to go look at it, and I would have gone over and done literally anything you wanted. But once those three days are up, that's it for me. So let's go back over this list. Um, your clients are not your friends, right? A business is not a charity. Doesn't mean you can't help people, and it doesn't mean you can't be friendly, but they're not your friends, and your business is not a charity. Get all agreements in writing. Everything in writing, guys. Everything, everything, everything always in writing. No favors. Diversify your client base so that you're not screwed and ending up as an employee again after starting your own business because you can't afford to be fired by your one and only client. Document everything and test everything before you start working. If you're working on electrical or plumbing, figure out if there's leaks beforehand. Turn those shutoff valves on and off and make sure that they don't start leaking just as soon as you touch that handle to shut it off. Test, document, take pictures beforehand so that you can't be accused of having done things that you didn't do after the fact. And finally, set the expectations and provide disclaimers for the things that you know are always going to be sort of iffy in the up in the air after the fact. And that's about it for this video. video. Looks like we're uh, just shy of an hour, so that's not too bad. I uh, hope you guys are all out there killing it, and I'll see you on the next one.